was standing at the doorway of a cabin on Cashier Creek. Up on the ridge, the bloodhounds have your scent. And between you and a fortune, between you and escape, yawn the white jaws of a deadly cottonmouth. Escape. Produced by William N. Robeson and carefully contrived to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to the worn-out acres of a poor white trash farmer somewhere in the southern mountains. In Irvin S. Cobb's great tale of vengeance, Snake Doctor... This story is about snakes and two men. One man was afraid of snakes and the other wasn't. The one who wasn't was known along Cashier Creek as Snake Doctor. His cabin was near the creek bottom land where there was a powerful lot of cottonmouths. And he earned his meager living by rendering down their soft fats and bottling the oil and selling it. For everyone knew there was no remedy for rheumatism like snake oil. Snake Doctor was harmless enough, but there was folks who honestly believed that he was a colleague of Beelzebub just because he wasn't afraid of snakes. That's not all they believed about him. Now, uh, the man who was afraid of snakes was Jafe Morner, who was Snake Doctor's nearest neighbor. Chief was the kind of man we all know who suspected, feared, and hated anything he didn't understand. And he understood neither Cottonmouths nor the Snake Doctor. In short, Chief was ornery, ignorant, and shiftless. He'd rather shoot squirrels and chop cotton. He'd rather fish than hoe corn. And that's just what he's doing now, fishing. Down at the big hole with his son and heir, Finney who's uh, old enough, but not quite bright enough to handle a gun. Missed him, Doc. Finney, you blame fool. I told you not. Trump on him before he gets in the creek. What? The cotton map. Trump on him in front of you. What what the vomit? You got him. Keep your foot on him while I get a stick. You don't need to, son. He's dead. Now, come here. Pa, how'd you ever hit anything in that rifle, Pa? I had a bead drawn on him right now. You damn fool! Be... Oh, Pa. Fine off of the blame snake was as I'm fishing. Heck, you was sunning yourself not more than there to you. How'd you like to get yourself bit? Won't be no fish around here till thunderation after all that racket. Well, come on home. Let's go get some fiddles. Chief Mourner tossed his bait can into the creek and threw a stick after it. He stood there, watching the stick drift slowly toward the big hole, where the creek widened behind a jam of driftwood. Chief watched as the eddy caught the stick and sucked it beneath the dam. Chief was curious. He moved downstream a rod or two and waited, watching the water boil up from under the driftwood. But the stick didn't come up. That was strange. Must have caught under there in a tangle of water-soaked and sunken logs. Probably it'd stay there for months. Maybe stay there always. Jafe considered this, and an idea began to form in his slow mind as he and Finney started for home. Hey, Pa. How much oil you reckon's in this one, Pa? Pa? What you jawing about? It's old cotton mouth. How much oil do Throw you reckon? Throw it down. Throw it down? Why? I'm in the Throw take... it down like I say. I'll make oh, you wish Oh, Pa, you... I was aiming on rendering the old cotton mouth's fat like the snake doctor does and sell it and make myself some money. I don't like to squirm with things around me. Yeah, but it's Leave it where it drop, Penny. Now, come on home. 
You scared of cotton masks, Pa? I know better than to get myself bit by him. Tip Bailey know the fella got himself bit once. He won a drop of liquor for miles. So he goes to work and he cuts open a little old live chicken and puts it on his leg where the bite was. And the fella lived, too. Yeah. Reckon Mr. Rice ever gets himself bit handling cotton masks like he does? Who? Mr. Rives. Who? Mr. Rives, the old snake doctor's real name. Ma says I oughtn't call him snake doctor. Never mind cause... what your ma says. Nobody in my family's calling no snake-loving scum Mr. Rives. Heck, that's what I say, Pa. We'll just see what you do. Sure, Pa. You know, I could have made myself some money rendering that cotton mass fat down in the oil. How much you reckon old snake doctor makes out in the oil he sells? I don't know. Tip Bailey says old snake doctor's got more than maybe a thousand dollars hid away somewhere in his cabin. <laughs> more than that, most likely. Cuss it, old miser don't spend nothing. Ain't got nothing save that old rack of bones mare his. Tip Bailey says whenever old snake doctor sets foot out in his place, he's got the granddaddy of all cotton mouths that he leaves out in the cabin to stand guard on his money. Huh. Yeah, Tip Bailey says that, yeah, he, he'd see old snake doctor put him in his pocket. Live cotton mouths. Snake Doctor ain't fitting to be alive as Seth. Oh, Ma says he ain't bad. Says he don't mean nobody harm. Your Ma better be careful who she's associating with. Well, she says he doesn't have any good sense. Had the fever too much. You ever been in the Snake Doctor's cabin, Pa? I don't have nothing more than I have to do that snake-loving hoodoo. Tip Bailey says that he better wouldn't be no task at all for some no good to poke around in the Snake Doctor's shack and... Find all the money and make off with it. Hmm. Well, these blame sons are down there rendering me down. Look at my head, Pa. It's all full of sweat. Look it. See, hmm. there's all full of sweat. Down hmm. there, gourd full of sweat coming off. Why are you turning down that way, Pa? Coming on noon, dinner be most ready. I'm going to tell that snake-loving hoodoo that there's some of them cottonmouths on the creek side of Deadman. Heck, he knows that. I'm going to tell him he's got my leave to catch him. You don't need to come along if you don't want to. If you're going over to his place, I'd kind of go and see it for myself. He ain't to home, else why is he to show himself by now? I reckon so. Pa, can, can you see any snakes? I told you to keep uh, an eye out for it. I bet it's in one of them chinks, Pa. Pa, I bet the money's up in I one of them chinks. I ain't looking for no money. Huh. Must be a dang snake itself living in a place like this. Pa, I know you ain't looking for any money, but if you was, wouldn't you look in that chink right up there? Who? Uh, where, son? Right there, second log above the fireplace. On the right, you see that there hole? Yeah. Yeah, I reckon I would look up there. Well, since we're here... Might as well see for myself. Boy, I wouldn't be a mite surprised if old Snake Doc... Pa, Pa, huh? Pa, somebody's out on the porch. It, it's a Snake Doctor. Well, are you looking for something, Chief Mortar? <laughs> yeah, I, I was looking for you. I want you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look here, you old hoodoo. What's the idea of sneaking up on folks who took the trouble to come all the way down here to do you a favor? Chief Mourner and his boy slouched out onto a six acre detonant. They walked silently, unnerved by their encounter with the snake doctor. Finally, it was Finney who broke the silence. Yes, sir. Like as not that a old snake doctor had a dang moccasin squitching around in his pocket whilst he was talking to you. Do you mind how his eyes was when he come in? Yeah. Dang, if it wasn't blazing like when you run across a rabbit or a cat in the dark. Skid me out of ten years' growth, dang, if it didn't. And you mind how I kept looking up at the wall where I said I bet he had his money between the chinks? Finney. Hmm? Finney, don't you say nothing to your ma about us being at that snake doctor's place. You understand? Why should I? Just don't. Don't you know go night again. 
cuss old vomit, you'd have thought we was prowlers the way he acted. Busy? That you out there? Yeah, Ma. Dinner about ready? Is Paul with you, son? Yeah. If I time enough for dinner to go down to the spring and get me some cold water? Well, that's when you stir your thumbs again. Hurt up, son. I'm hungry. Catch anything, Jay? How you think I can catch fish with Fenny flying off my gun at cotton mouths all the time? Uh, ain't this heat more than a body can bear? Yeah. And it cooler by the creek? Yeah. Uh, poor old Miss Rives come by here a spell ago. My knife shook to pieces with the chill. Oh, he come by, did he? Well, did he come in? Just for a minute. Oh, just for a minute, eh? What'd he want? He wanted could I give him some for his ailment. Just back could drag one side foot for the other. Barely could make it up here from his place. Reckon he must be down bed with the fever by now. I could tell by the tension was rising in him when he left here and started back home again. I give him a dose out in our butler's acre draft. Would have given him a little smidge and liquor on Oh, that. you would, huh? Oh, please don't, Jeff. <laughs> don't, Jeff. Don't want me. Just poor old Miss Rives. <laughs> Mr. Rives. Mr. Rives. How many times I got to tell you that that old hoodoo's name is Snake Doctor? Oh, he don't mean nobody no harm. He made it skin a louse for its hiding towel, and you calling him Mr. Rives. You'll be calling him honey and sugar next without I learn you, did it? Please, Jane, please! Pet names, huh? Tail by the tatch, could you? Well, I aim to learn you. What's his name now? Well, what's your poor Mr. Rob's name now? Nee, doctor. Kizzy Mourner rubbed the ugly red welt on her scrawny arm and gave the frying pan full of sizzling side meat a hopeless nudge. She prayed that the weight of the victuals might take the edge off Jafe's temper. Finney slouched in from the spring and saw the mark on her arm. Pa been whomping you again, Ma? She didn't answer. What'd you do this time? She silently dished up the hogback and cornbread for her two men and... While they sat at table, she ate on her feet, serving them between bites, as was the custom in the Mourner household. After dinner, Finney stretched out under the chinaberry tree, and Kizzy sat on the porch, fanning herself and dipping snuff with the peach twig, scouring it back and forth on her gums. Jafe took his ease on the floor of the back room, but he didn't sleep. One thing he had seen that day, and another thing he had heard, he was adding them together. That stick that had disappeared under the log jam and the snake doctor's money. It was four o'clock before any of them stirred, and then Jafe spoke to his wife for the first time since noon. Where's that that vile drinking liquor, Kizzy? By the window. You took it out in your pocket before you laid down. I ought to carry a vial of drinking liquor with me. I might get bit by a moccasin soon as Pa would. You better not let me catch you. You find it, Jay? I just remembered I won't be needing to tow no spits along with me while I'm going. I wouldn't take no chance, Jay. There's one cotton mouse. Cotton mouse is all down the slashes, else along the creek. Where I'll be this evening is up along Bailey's Ridge in the high ground. Vixen to go shooting? Yeah, I aim to gun me a chance of young squirrels to on dust time. Reckon I'll come along, Pa. You stay in here. Oh, dang it, it'd be steaming in the place when the rain comes down. Pa, you might be needing me in case... You stay any... here! Oh, Pa. Kizzy set up a snack of cold supper on the shelf. Likely I won't get back till it's plumb dark. <laughs> Chief Mourner turned north through his struggling cornrows, and in a minute he was lost from sight. He kept on for nearly a mile until he came to a wild red mulberry tree. Where mulberries are, there's bound to be squirrels. Very neatly, 
He shot two young greys through the head. But Jafe was a master marksman. And uh, unsuspected by any who knew him, Jafe had another quality denied most of his kind. He had an imagination. Today, it was in excellent working order. He tied the brain squirrels together and swung them over his shoulder. If needed, they would be his alibi. Then he sat down under a tree a while. I got plenty of time. Don't need to get down to Snake Doctor's place till it's about dusk when he comes out to feed that swayback mare his. <laughs> Mr. Rhymes. He sat out two brisk thunder showers and the intervals between them. Then he started off in a wide arc down Bailey's Branch along the skirts of Little Cypress Lash to the sunken flats edge in Cashier Creek. Took more than an hour of careful traveling before he came to his destination. A screen of haw bushes less than 50 yards behind the snake doctor's cabin. No matter how ailing he is, you'd get up and come out to feed that rack of Boone's mare. Mr. Rives. Well, I learn him to go colleaguing around another man's woman. Chief Mourner let his jealousy heat him to a white hatred. At this moment, he was avenging his honor. Thus was spared the embarrassment of admitting to himself that the real reason he was here was the snake doctor's money, hidden behind the log by the fireplace. The home-loving, snake-loving vomit. Yeah. Ten minutes from now, I'll chunk him down a big hole in the creek like I did that stick this morning. He'd go down and never come out. Nobody will miss him. Nobody will know he's gone for at least twice a week, maybe a month. Maybe if I get around to it, I might come back this way someday. Poke around that cabin of his. Jafe Mourner's speculations were cut short. The cabin door opened and a figure stepped out into the growing dusk and walked toward the stable. He saw the snake doctor's loppy old straw hat and his dark coat drawn over a pair of hunched narrow shoulders. At this distance, he couldn't miss. And it didn't. The figure jerked backwards and then went face forward. Jafe started for him, and then he stopped. His eyes bugged. His mouth formed a scream that he couldn't utter. His rifle dropped to the ground. He had just killed the snake doctor, killed him dead with a 32 caliber slug through the head. And there on his door sill stood snake doctor, whole and sound and staring at him. Jafe Mourner, what you done? <laughs> the scream came at last, for Jafe Mourner had seen the devil... This snake doctor who arose alive from his bullet-riddled body. Jafe whirled and ran into the deep, darkening woods, whimpering like a whipped puppy as he tore through the brush. Escape. He must escape. He must get under the shelter of a sound roof to have the protection of four walls around him. So he ran and ran for hours. It was close to midnight when he came out on a dirt road a short distance southeast of his dead. And beyond the next bend, he'd be in sight of home. Then he stopped. Around the bend, coming toward him, was a joggling light, a lantern hanging on a buggy. Jake flattened himself in a clump of brush to hide until the traveler passed. And then, just as the rig was opposite him, he heard a call coming from the other Hello direction. There. Who's he jogging? Oh, there. Stay. Stay. It's me. It's David Flair. Is that you, Tip Fella? Yep. Hoofing it out from the junction, tolerable tired, if anybody should ask you. What brings you out this time of night, Davey? Somebody sick? Sick? Nothing. There's been hell a popping in these here bottoms in that city, boy. Now, yeah, what you mean? A killing, that's what I mean. A dirty, cold blooded killing if there ever was one. I don't say. Who's got a kill? Well, I'm a fixing to tell you now. Tell you who. Uh, it happened just around dusk time at old Snake Doctor's place. Yeah? Was Tim was killed? Now, just give me time. Uh-huh. Seems like Snake Doctor's been a killing lately. He's, he's pretty bad off today. I mean, yesterday. Uh-huh. And... So, long about five o'clock, when the rain was a-lulling a little bit, Miss Kizzy Mourner, she fluttered it down from her place to his and fetching some physic with her. And played a hot bit. Now, Miss Mourner's mighty thoughty one for doing things uh, Don't folk. you want to hear this? Uh, go ahead, go well, ahead. Well, it seems like she wasn't afeard of the snake doctor's place. Well, I'd have been all over that. Well, pretty soon after she got there, seems like he tried to get up out of his bed and go feed that old crow bait nag of his. Yeah? Rain had started in again, but then just pouring down hard, so... She made him stay where he was at, and she put on his old hat and throwed on his old coat around her to keep off the worst of the wet. And, uh -huh. and then she started out the back door to do the feeding herself. Yeah. 
And no more than she got outside and a shot come from the edge of the wood and down she went with a bullet through her brain. I killed her? Dead in a doll. Oh. But uh, who done it? That low-flung husband of hers done it. That's who done it. He must have followed her down to Snake Doctors and just laid in wait for her. And it certain was him then. Huh? Well, I sure think Snake Doctor jumped up when he heard the shot and he catched a quick look at Jeep over the fence. Yeah. Oh, and there was a long streak on Kizzy's arm where he must have whooped her at during the day. Well, hangs too sight too good. Uh, catch him? No, but they will. Some thinks that he made for the slashes and hid out there. Tracks let old fat away. Uh-huh. Oh, there'd be a line of men throwed all the way around Little Cypress for Slinna. Uh, Sheriff got there yet? No, but he's due any minute with his pack of dogs. They telephoned in from Gallup Mills that he's on his way. Good. Trail ought to lay good, too, the ground being damp like it is. Mm-hmm. Old Snake Doctor, he's crying on and raving around up at Morning's place, saying the Lord's going to strike the murder down his tracks. But I'm a-putting my main dependence on them there bloodhounds. On them first, and then maybe on a stout plow line and a limb of a tree. Yeah, it's more certain. <laughs> yeah, I'm just putting out to my place to fetch my oldest boy. I wouldn't want him to miss a lynching. Oh, he's a good-sized crowd up there already. Well, I'll go up and join him. I've got a pistol here on my hip pocket. No. Oh, Miss Morning, she's always a good-hearted, hard-working Kizzy. woman. Kizzy, she's dead. A shot Kizzy. Did you hear something just then? Can't say it again. Probably a rabbit breaking through the brass. Hey, listen, listen, listen. Yeah. Oh, a sheriff's coming. You can hear them hounds of his. And I got to hurry. Get up there, Biff. I'll see you back in the morning. Oh, you sure will. Jafe didn't have time to waste mourning his dead wife. He was even a little relieved to know that the snake doctor wasn't the devil incarnate. He had a chance against a lynch mob and a pack of bloodhounds. This was the kind of antagonist he could understand and outsmart. Jape's imagination went to work again as he backtracked along the creek bottom in the spotty moonlight. Gotta throw them dogs off the trail. Gotta wait a creek even if it is full of cotton mouths. <clears throat> Must be all around me by now. Folks say they don't strike in the water. Well, I hope them folks is right. Gotta get back to Snake Doctor's. Get his money while he's still up at my place with Kizzy's remains. Get his money, and then the rest will be easy. I'll make for the deep timber. Cross country to the river. Make it by tomorrow's sundown. Hire me a shanty boat to ferry me to the Arkansas site. Get me a haircut and catch a train for somewhere else. But gotta get Snake Doctor's money first. Snake Doctor's cabin was dark and empty when Jay reached it. And he needed light for his search. There were a few dull embers in the fireplace, and he threw on some kindling. But it didn't light. Very well, he knew where the chink was. He'd find it in the dark. He scrabbled at the logs, felt some bark give, felt the clay mortar crumble under his fingernails. Here it was. A hole big enough for a man's arm. He plunged his hand into it, touched something slick and smooth, and then something sharp plunged into his thumb. <laughs> At that moment, the fire flickered to life. Jafe yanked his hand out of the hole, saw two tiny bleeding punctures in his thumb, and at the mouth of the hole stretched the wide-open jaws of a cotton mouth. <laughs> it worked fast. He felt the pain leaping from his thumb to his hand, seeping up his arm. If he only had some liquor, if he had a fresh-killed chicken to slap on the wound, he had nothing. Then a sharp, horrible pain wrenched his heart, and a second... And there in the firelight, the huge cottonmouth poised in its crevice. Jafe leaped out of the shack, started blindly for the timber, staggered, stumbled, and pitched forward on his face. His open mouth full of weeds and muddy grass and stems. The cramping fingers of his outstretched right hand almost touching a reddish black smear on the wet trampled grass. Good riddance, bad gravy, it's good riddance. I'd call it that, wouldn't you, Dr. Bradshaw? Well, I reckon there's sort of a rough justice in the way he died. Look, his hand reaching out just about touches the blood where his woman fell. Uh, this has been quite a night, Davis. I just examined the body of a man who appears to have been killed by snake bite. 
Uh, good and quick, too, judging by the evidence. Well, Doc, ain't that the way a cotton mouth always does kill a man? Something like I've always heard tell... Uh, never tell... mind what you heard. I'm going by the facts. I've been practicing medicine in this county for going on to 46 years. And I tell you that in all my life, I've never known but two or three people actually being bitten by water moccasins. And until tonight, I never had personal knowledge of anybody dying from the bite of any kind of a snake. Hey, what's going on over there, Doc? Hey, is that mourner boy kicking up that butt? Hey, yeah, he's no good just like his phone. Hey, what's your trouble, Chip? And Finney here's went out in his head. I'm going to kill the snake and bitten my paw. And then I'm going to give that snake doctor a whooping for keeping a reptile in his place. Your paw got just what is his due, Finney. That snake doctor ain't to blame now. He's a hoodoo devil. Now, now, look here, boy. Mr. Rives promised all his savings. Nearly a hundred dollars to pay for burying your mother decent. That's how much he thought of her. Now, now, go on home, behave yourself. Now, go on, Finney. There ain't no reason for you hanging Somebody out Somebody ought to kill yeah, that guy that bit my paw, and I'm huh. gonna do it. Hey, hey, Doc, just a minute ago, you started to say something about snake bite, not a killing. Well, how do you account for Jafe here? Well, the late Jafe Mourner had a rotten bad heart, David. Oh, he sure did. Yesterday proves that. Now, I don't mean in that sense. I mean there was an organic weakness. A curious thing, though, there was no swelling anywhere. Well, there's them two marks on his thumb, them snake scashes, like I've seen. Well, that don't explain how... Oh. Huh? What's it? It's pretty water. He's in the cabin. That fool kid. Come on, Doc. He probably shot somebody. I, I shot at him. I shot at him, but I didn't hear it. It's going to get me like it got my paw. Come on, Doc. Come on. He said he shot at something in the cabin. Come on. Well, no, I I don't see anything. Hmm. Well, Finney's had enough happen to him yesterday and today to upset even a bright boy. So we can't... Oh, there it is. Uh, what? That cotton mouth up there in that hole in the log. Huh? Oh, who's oh, that? A snake doctor told me about that varmint. Uh, look at him closer, David. Oh, no, sir. Uh, go no, ahead, sir. go ahead. It's just a stuffed snake. Stuff? Yeah. Snake doctor believes in precautions. Because that hole's where he hides his money. Well, that snake could scare away anybody who didn't know it was stuffed. But just to be sure, old snake doctor lined the hole with coils of barbed wire. Oh, oh, oh I see. What, you think at them marks on Jeff's thumb he got off of the barbed wire, huh? There could be. A lot stronger hearts than Jeff Mourner's would have stopped beating at a scare like that. Well, I'll be switched. Old Snake Doctor's a cute one, ain't he? Escape, produced by William N. Robeson and directed by Norman MacDonald, today brought you Snake Doctor by Irvin S. Cobb, adapted for radio by Fred Howard, with Bill Conrad as Jafe, Paul Fries as Finney, Ruth Parrott as Kizzy, Barton Yarver as Davis, Louis Van Ruten played Snake Doctor and Tip Bailey, while Fred Howard was the doctor. Alan Reed was heard as the narrator. The original musical score was conceived by Cy Feuer with Eddie Dunstetter at the console. Next week, you are alone in a remote old world village inhabited by cat people. And you are desired by a beautiful cat girl who wants your soul. Next week, we escape with Algernon Blackwood's eerie story titled Ancient Sorceries. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>